Hi, everyone. Welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones. Thank you so very much for joining us. Good stuff to talk about today. The immigration battle between President Obama and Congress with millions of families caught in the middle. We'll talk about the growing length and cost of the yet-to-be Milwaukee streetcar project. And we'll talk a little bit about sports. Are the Green Bay Packers Super Bowl bound? And are the new Milwaukee Bucks something to really be excited about? All right, let me introduce everybody. You know longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally? And Kevin Fisher, who spent many years as a broadcast journalist. Of course, Denise Calloway, communications and public relations professional. And Gerard Randall, education consultant and job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, let's talk first about the immigration controversy, which appears to have come to a head now. President Obama says he'll use his presidential powers to provide millions of undocumented immigrants a sort of legal status which prevents them from being deported. Congressional Republicans vow to stop him, saying he's ignoring the laws of the country and acting more like a king trying to unilaterally get what he wants. Who's going to win this fight, or will it just go on forever and ever like it seems to have for the past decade, Kevin? I think that uh, the president eventually will lose because even the American public and his own party sees this as a it's breathtaking, a usurping of authority, a power grab from a president who says he's not an emperor, but is acting like one, arrogantly. Uh, he is a president. He's not an emperor. He's not a dictator. He enforces laws. Congress makes legislation. Congress passes laws that he can then veto. Uh, it, it's, it's an incredible uh, 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 abuse of power that may come back to bite him because or it sets a horrible precedent because you may have a Republican president someday and a Democrat majority in the Senate and House and the Republican president could could resort to these tactics. Republican uh, presidents have. Yeah. Well, they have used this administrative power. But we're talking and, about this president. No, Ronald Reagan, no, Reagan no, uh, George Bush. Let me just let me just finish, Denise. That's fine, and um, then we can get and, to and some then you facts. can bash Republicans after, I'm, bash Republicans. after I'm done. All right. I'm just going to talk about uh, facts, Kevin. You but, might want to listen. But you have a president who, John Boehner's staff documented 22 times where the president <laughs> actually made statements that he would not do what he did because he could not do what he did because he didn't have the authority. And then he goes and, and, and does it anyway. Uh, you're going to have an incredible situation where you're going to have people pouring over the borders. You're going to see an increase in crime. You're going to see drug trade and human trafficking. You've had... Uh, Dogs and cats living together. There's nothing to, be make, to make jokes about. Not when you've had minors tell immigration officials, minors, illegal immigrants who are minors have to told immigration officials that they have confessed to murder. And now you, you, this is, we're supposed to be a nation of laws and we have the president saying, don't worry about it. Just come on in. We, we don't. We don't. We'll just. We'll just forget does. about it. Not even close, not even close to seems, what this it does. It seems like we have laws that pertain to all of us in the studio, but they don't pertain to illegal immigrants coming in, in into the country. And you're going to see uh, uh, all kinds of money that that's, we're going to need for all kinds of social services that we we just don't have. I, I think this is horrible. And as as, as one uh, a person uh, uh, stated this uh, this week, who's in, who is a, a law enforcement official, and they've got a difficult job mm -hmm. to begin with, this makes it almost impossible. Uh, one of the sheriffs said that this is a this is a destruction of democracy. It, it really, really is. Or will the history books I, say he didn't play nice, but he got it done? You know what? We don't even have to go to the history books. Let's just go to a handful of facts. Number one, we're not going to have people crossing the borders because of this and in droves because this applies to people who are already here. Number two, the president absolutely has the authority to use executive powers. If you take a look at the last two Republican presidents, uh, Bush and Reagan, they actually have used the, their executive powers more than this president Not has. To this yes, extent. they have. Not to yes, this they have. So it's an issue if you can't say it's okay if one president, group of presidents uh, does it, but it's not okay if this president does it. The other thing is I think it's so interesting that Mr. Boehner's staff is compiling all these facts where there's one basic fact they don't talk about, that, about. And that is in 2003, last year, the Senate passed Republicans and Democrats a comprehensive immigration act. John Boehner, the same person who's complaining the loudest now, wouldn't even bring it to the House floor for a vote. Because it would have passed. It, that's exactly right. And so if John Boehner has 
is upset about the fact that the president has used his lawful executive power, he has nobody to blame but himself. Because if he would have brought this to the House floor for a vote, we would not be talking about this issue, and the president would not have had to have taken this action, which is clearly within his authority and ability to do. This is not the sky is falling, let's all run around like chickens with our heads cut off. We're talking about not, as the president said, if you would have listened to his speech, we're not talking about people who are people who are felons. We're talking about families, parents who have children who were born in this country. This doesn't apply to large groups of people. And in fact, one five of the million, complaints they have to be one of the complaints years. have five million, and not all years. of them are Boy Scouts. But, but, I'm sorry. Well, but let me let me tell you, let's not let's not as you're trying to do throughout the baby with the bathwater here. The reality is we have a significant number of people in this country who are law-abiding citizens whose children were born here, who pay taxes, and they have a three-year window to, in essence, get their act together. This isn't amnesty, as some people have described it. It is not only a legal thing to do, but it is a decent thing to do. We're not going to deport five million parents or and separate them million? from their children. We're not going to do that. Is, is, is President Obama not pushing but shoving Congress to get something done? Well, I, I, I don't think it inspires any opportunity to work together. Uh, a couple of things that were said. One, when Reagan and Bush acted, they acted after they had the force of the law behind them because Congress had acted and Which basically re had refused to do that. And, and uh, well, if you want to go down that route, look at all the times that Harry Reid stopped legislation from getting to the House. The, um, the bottom line in this is that we've had this yin and yang, and uh, it's not going to stop. Uh, and it certainly, it might even be intensified, uh, because there will be lots of bills that will end up on the president's desk that he's not going to like, he's not in going January. to sign. And, uh, <clears throat> and this really doesn't create any opportunities for them to, to work together. The other is, I do worry that no matter how um, uh, necessary it may be to reconnect families, um, the ends doesn't justify the means when you do have laws, as Kevin said, that ought to be followed. The courts ultimately are going to decide whether or not the president exceeded his authority, uh, and it, that's going to take some time. So over the next year, at least, you're going to have stalemates between the president and Congress that may not necessarily have needed to be because of this action. Should Obama just have dropped it and said, I'm a lame duck, I'm not going to get anything done? Or do you admire him for pushing this? Uh, I'll I, I tell you what I'm happy about, uh, how idiotic the Republicans were. Uh, the truth of the matter is, Obama, by delaying this action until after the election, gave the opportunity for the Republicans, who were successful in the election, to be heroes. If they had said, we won the Senate, uh, we already have the House, we can actually pass immigration reform, they could have, in fact, started attracting some Latinos to their party. Uh, because a lot of Latinos were upset that Obama delayed it till after the election. But once the election took place, and the Republicans made it clear that hating immigrants and hating Latinos was part of their party platform, they were not going to pass immigration reform, they, they gave Barack Obama the perfect opportunity to be a hero. They set him up again. And, and now, you know what they're talking about? They're not talking about, you know, he has taken a modest first step to keep families together and not, and not deport 5 million people out of 11 or 12 million immigrants. They could say, you know what, we'll take the next step. We will, in fact, set up a pathway to, to uh, citizenship in this country for Latinos. Latinos who voted for Barack Obama overwhelmingly, uh, Republicans have said, you know, a lot of these Latinos, they're very religious people. We think we ought to be able to attract them to our party. Not when you're hating them and, and saying you want to, you know, turn, turn back this opportunity for them to not have to fear deportation and have to hide in the shadows. Let me tell you another thing. The idea that Barack Obama 
has poisoned the well of, uh, of Republicans who, from the first day he got in office, have done nothing but promote hatred toward him, have done nothing but oppose every single action he tried to take, including uh, getting this country on, on the path to employment after the worst economic disaster in our country's history, other than the Great Depression. Why can't people disagree on policy without being, I know, uh, being when, spiteful when, when or hateful? Oppose, when McConnell. you oppose the president every single day on every single action, on that, policy. that and that yeah. is it, not exactly. policy. That's what that it's been. Hatred it's toward been, an it's African been, American it's been president. Policy. Just it's as not just it, policy. It, how, how is it that every Democratic policy is wrong exactly. according to Republicans. That can't well, be that wrong. is the reason we have two parties. But, but no, one, one party one believes party one thing, another together. party believes it the other. It's more than just the policy. Mitch McConnell, who's going to be the new head of the Senate, what did he say before Barack Obama had finished his first term? He said, Our goal is to make sure he's not reelected. That was before. That Policy. Well, of course, that that's politics. Any, it no, is. It's politics, but not policy. I mean, of Gerard course was saying, the "Can't we just are agree to on see Barack Obama not reelected?" Gerard said, "This is not about put politics. it in the context of the health care bill policy. It's that the president politics. led on a straight party line vote." The, the thing is, there was this, a vote, this though, president right? has accomplished. You can thank like, Harry Reid for there not having been a whole lot of votes more than that could have been. On the immigration bill in the House. The Senate accomplished something on immigration. The only you know, body here who hasn't accomplished anything on immigration is the, is the Republican House. And I, they refuse. I, I assure you that so there now, will be now legislation Obama going to the president that will be on great. immigration great. Six reform. Years, six years after Barack Obama said this needs to be a critical He could have done it in his first two years. When he he could have done it in his first two years when he had control total control. Of everything. Exactly. You know his mistake in the first two years was to try to compromise with Republicans, thinking that it was going to that, be done. That had Excuse nothing me. to do yes, with compromise with Republicans. Thinking that it would be done in and fair yeah. nature and a balance, and it didn't happen. a few other things to do to get us out of the great Like ram health care reform down the throats of the American people. That's why his approval or rating is below 40 Actually, I think the best thing that could happen that was a bad thing is that he now has the opportunity to enforce something with his administration, and they've already demonstrated they're inept. Mm -hmm. All right, next topic. <laughs> Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett vows to go ahead with his controversial downtown streetcar project, and he's hoping that construction will begin next year. If aldermen agree with him, it'll be a little longer than originally planned, with a price tag that could hit more than $120 million. Milwaukee Bucks owners have got to be thinking, OK, if they can come up with money for a new streetcar, he should be able to come up with some money to build a new arena. <laughs> Is that going to happen? Uh, I think there's a big difference between creating a transportation system for your city and building a, a stadium for billionaires, frankly. I think one is legitimate, uh, you know, for, you know, a legitimate project for government, and the other one may well not be. Uh, uh, we, uh, we talked a lot about this streetcar on this, on this program, and none of us are terribly uh, wild about it. But here's one thing I'll say about it. It is actually going to be something. <laughs> We're actually going to have a modern system, the start of a modern system here, that now at least it's in a popular area, a popular route that goes up towards the university, goes into the downtown, and now is headed towards the south side as well. It's the center of what can be a system that you could build on in the future. Uh, the, the, the mayor is determined to do it. And uh, he, there's some money to do it, and apparently there is some some financial, you know, things you could do to make it possible to put it in place, and it would be the start of something. Most cities do, in fact, have more than just a bus system. We know that. Most cities our size. We have held it up for years and years and decades and decades, even when we had some money in hand that could have really created uh, a, a, a great kind of uh, mass transit between Milwaukee and Waukesha, except Waukesha didn't want it because they didn't want to be connected to Milwaukee. Uh, you know, we, we, he, Tom Barrett is trying to use some of this money to actually start something, and I give him credit for that. Is it a project for white yuppies? Uh, well, if I you look at one, um, it, it, it's a project for millionaires who live in uh, uh, million-dollar condos in the in the downtown the area. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, uh, there are good TIF districts and there are bad TIF districts. This is a bad TIF district. Uh, you already have the route in place, so there's limited 
possibilities to spur new development right. that would uh, r bring in new revenue to pay for those bonds that are going to fund this project, okay? The, the uh, property taxes are diverted away from MPS, from METC, right. from the city, from the county. The city could use that money for policing. The county could use that uh, money for its bus system, for mental health, for the zoo, for the parks. Uh, if anybody should be upset, it's those people at MPS, those people at MATC, those people who live outside the footprint of this trolley folly, who are not going to benefit from it. It's going to be your downtown crowd, and, and we are not going to have enough property tax money to pay off those bonds for a long, 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 long time. And who gets cheated? Who gets punished? M MPS, MATC, MPS gets punished because of the regulations that the state has put on how property tax can be used. That's how MPS gets punished. But you admit you're going to be anything to do with the streetcar. I'm, I'm not going to admit that at all, Kevin, because the, you're mixing apples and oranges. These are but two very different things. Can't you make it's that argument against any TIF, tif, tif district? Uh, if the economic development in that district increases the opportunity to generate more uh, taxes down the line, that then makes sense. And, and that's probably one of the things that's going to come out of this, is whether or not it's a legitimate use of TIF money. The thing that bothers me is, OK, he bills it. What happens then around the operating costs? If every man, woman, and child rode that, um, that, that car at a buck apiece, which is what they're anticipating the fare will be, they're still going to come up two-thirds short. short of the operating costs on an annual basis. And then, as we've said many times on this show before, is it really of the highest priority for this community to put resources into? And I, 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 I still don't see that. With, uh, with these new services like Uber, and I can't think of what's the other one? Lyft. Right. Lyft and Uber. Does that uh, make a trolley less attractive? If you can walk out of your hotel and just, you know, punch in a number and those, get a those ride of for ordinary so. folk. Uh, those so. are for people who can take a cab anywhere they want. Right. I mean, I think this is really for people who want that kind of experience that's very different from what you would get from a cab or from Lyft or Uber. It's for people who see it as part of an experience to, um, at least this is what I've looked at it as when I've gone to other communities and I've taken the trolley that's taking me through historic and, and sightseeing places. That is an experience you want that's very different from getting into a car or on a bus, for that matter. You know, it, it, Joel's right. This is, is perhaps not ideal, but it's an effort to move it forward. We're talking about part of this money, too, like we could spend it on anything we want to spend it on. And the <laughs> reason we've talked about this on the show a number of different times is because there's a limit on how some of the money can be spent. It has to be spent this way. On new it can't, transportation. On new transportation. It can't be spent on the existing bus system. It can't be spent on MPS. To, to talk about this money, but like, the this will be the, 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 Exactly, the, the, exactly. That's the problem. No, and I can the, finish. The, 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 <laughs> I can finish. <laughs> okay. To talk about this money as if it is somehow magical money that we could spend anywhere isn't true. And the reality of it is, when we take a look at what what has to be done to try to build and bring some rebirth to downtown, this has the potential to be a part of that. The, um, the, the 60 plus million dollars that comes from the Fed cannot be reattached to some other correct. project. The TIF money, however, Which I've tried draws and diverts from the existing tax money that would go to the other uh, taxing authorities, it takes that money away. It pulls it away from those areas so that you're going to end up getting less during that time frame that the TIF is in existence. That is a problem. And, and, and somehow or the other, you're right, the state has already put limits on how MPS can generate or any of the other taxing authorities Correct. can generate more tax money. So how do you replace that when you're pulling out some funding that normally would go to you? You're going to face a deficit right off the top because of that TIF. I don't think that's the case at all. I it is the case. That's that's already been declared. Yeah, that's what TIFs need, are. You need to study up. Yeah, on no, I do understand, Kiss. Really I think what you all need to study on and what you all need to think about is the fact that 
this is an opportunity for this community. Maybe we should all just sit over on the side and not do anything, because maybe it might not work, and maybe we might not get all the operating money back. Or we can say, this is an opportunity for us to try to do something that's going to make a difference in this community and has the potential for opportunity and for growth. And not everybody gets that. I, I, I think it's too optimistic. I, it I benefits understand. one part of one aldermanic district, and all the other uh, districts will have right. to pay for it, and they will not and that's benefit assuming from it. So you're making the assumption there will be no utilization by anybody else. By in their the own projections. It, by their own projections, it's going to cost about $2.3 million. They're going to get about $600,000 in. Uh, in fees for from fares, and then another 250 by their projections, and money that will come in from marketing, uh, f marketing fees. That leaves you then with the other two thirds of the money coming from where? And nobody this, has an answer. And to that. and and their response typically has been, "We'll just ask the state for a subsidy." Well, that's not going to happen. That will not happen. I also have to ask the question: Why didn't it run up through the north side? Those aldermen that are going to support this thing, they have to take a look at how it benefits their constituency. And I'm not seeing that happening at all with anyone except for those people who live in that downtown area in condos. And there's no have, economic development additionally that's going to be spurred by it. The world, I guess that makes sense. It does right. to me. Shifting gears, after a depressing end of the Milwaukee Brewers season last fall, the Packers lift our spirit, certainly look like Super Bowl-caliber team. The Bucks, with their new coach and their new young superstars, also look like they're going to generate some excitement this season. You've got to be pumped. You've got to be pumped. I think the Bucks are ahead of schedule. You know, everybody knew they were going to get good, and, and I think they're, they are getting good. I mean, I've, I've only seen one game so far, and it was a losing game with the Chicago Bulls. But they were competitive the entire game, and they could have won it. And watching the Packer uh -huh. game last week, Denise, you had to be excited. I felt good. I felt good. I felt like I was in Chicago. <laughs> um, it was. A, I think both teams have some energy and excitement that we just haven't seen in a long time. There's a sense of freshness with the Bucks. There's sen a sense of. Um, I don't want to say anything that could be seen as a curse about where the team might be going um, in 2015, but I think there's a sense of renewed optimism about the fact that this is a team, even though the defense is, is lousy, that can figure out a way to win. And your Badgers look fantastic. My Badgers look fantastic. You know, this all started with the Panthers winning and going to the NCAA tournament, and it's been nothing but gold ever since. <laughs> I, I, I watched history being made last weekend um, at Camp Randall with uh, the phenomenal uh, Gordon running for yardage that actually put him into the history books. It almost blew up the scoreboard. It, 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 it almost it, – certainly all of us who were standing out there watching that game felt really warm by the um, uh, the energy that he put into in, into that game. And, yeah, and the first quarter, it didn't look they're, like they're that. They are playing well at the right time. At the right time. And they kind of botched things up earlier in the mm. season, so they could go to a really nice bowl game. And the Packers, you've got to protect Rodgers, yeah. keep him from being harassed and sacked, and keep winning, because nobody wants to play at our place in January. All right. Yep. There we you go. We continue. Angry press conferences, bitter sound bites, looming lawsuits, just another day in the ongoing grudge match between Barack Obama and the Republican Party. You know, getting to this point takes a lot of calculation, political and psychological, and maybe some miscalculation, too. Here's Rick Horowitz. Whenever you're gearing up for battle, it helps to understand how your enemy's mind works. And after watching President Obama for, what, almost six years now, Republicans figure they've got him pegged, and you really can't blame them. They've seen him in action and in inaction. They're pretty sure they know what he's about. Factor number one, Obama hates going to war. The docs would call him uh, conflict averse. He'll look for any alternative before he commits to combat. For instance, uh, Vladimir Putin. Putin sends troops into Ukraine, and for weeks, Obama keeps offering him off-ramps, a chance to turn back from his aggression. Except Putin isn't the slightest bit interested in off-ramps. He wants a superhighway, Soviet-style. So Republicans figure Obama wilts under pressure. He won't stand up to bullying. He'll back down. That's one thing. Here's a second thing. Obama's very confident, maybe too confident, of his ability to think on his feet. So they keep the cameras rolling, and they wait for the latest outbreak of uh, loose tongue disease to box him in or make him look hypocritical. Emperors, anyone? Red lines? And then there's the third thing, maybe the biggest thing. Obama loves that Obama brand. I'm all about reason and I can work with anybody. I'm Mr. No Red States, No Blue States, just the United States, right? So they figure they can tempt him with promises of cooperation. 
or more accurately, they can freeze him with threats of non-cooperation. If the president goes ahead with this immigration plan of his, they keep saying, it'll destroy any chance of working with Congress on immigration or anything else. Because, of course, before this immigration fight, the president and congressional Republicans were such effective partners, such pals. After all, isn't that how we got that great bipartisan health care bill and that grand bargain to rein in the budget? Remember how that one sailed through the House of Representatives? Neither do I, and neither, I'm guessing, does the president. Maybe after all this time, he's finally figured out that that whole cooperation thing was only a dream he had. Maybe he finally figured out how the Republicans' mind works. They're just not that into you. Well, thanks, Rick, and thank you so much for joining us. Stay warm, enjoy the rest of your weekend, have a great Thanksgiving.